Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 22nd, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate you being here, so thanks. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, we're going to talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them on the slides, or relative to the slides, just so I don't get mixed up. I do have a little bit of an ADD issue. I get excited and I go off on tangents, as you know. Hopefully, we'll keep those tangents relative to what's on the slides. But as we get towards the end of the slides, right before we open it for live charts, if you have questions in general, we can certainly address those. When we do get to the live charts, I would ask you just hold off until we get to the live charts to begin asking about individual stocks. And you can ask about as many stocks as you want, but for your benefit, just ask about a stock and then hit return, and that way I know whether or not we've covered it. So this week's focus is patience, and I put revisited because I started putting together some slides this morning, and then I decided, well, wait a minute, let me let me just do a little, little search on this because I'm pretty sure I've covered this in the past, and then I found a plethora of slides that I've done before, both in the week of charts and in trading full circle, which you'll see I borrowed, I borrowed heavily from for this presentation. Sorry about that. And I think if there is one secret to trading, I think it is patience. I know I always say there's no secret to trading, and then I say, well, the secret to trading is Patience, and I really do think that above and beyond everything else, patience is most important. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I'll sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's talk about the importance of patience. Whenever I do a presentation or put together a video, I always first put myself in the mindset of what would I, what would I really want to, what would I, let me start over on that. What would I want to know 20 years ago, if I can go back in time and tell myself that I don't know today? And I think the biggest thing would be patience. Just be patience, patient and wait for that setup. Wait until you can't stand it because the setup looks so great. Wait until you feel like you have to trade. Don't trade because you want to trade or in some cases you might need to trade. But only trade when the setup presents itself. And then once you get that setup, be patient and let it trigger. Don't just jump right in. Don't front run it, so to speak, and we'll flesh this out in a second. Let it unfold, and if it becomes dead money, I know I beat the dead horse on dead money, just, just relax. As I often say, many times people will exit trades right before it makes a huge move. And unfortunately... Given a trend-following methodology, given my methodology, a trend-following methodology, unless you catch that occasional outlier, that, that occasional big trend, then you're going to have a hard time ever making any real money. Now, there's two forms of patience. The one, or number one, is to wait for your pitch, and that's to be patient take in taking only the best of the best Setups. I'm not a big sports guy, but from a little Googling, it sounds like a fat pitch is the pitch that just looks like a big fat cabbage ball to the hitter. It's like time actually slows and they just can easily hit the ball and those are the ones to hit. And the more patient hitters wait until it's more of a sure thing. And don't just swing at anything. And then the other form of patience is the patience to let things unfold once you 
actually take the setup. Now, as I said a minute ago, you actually have to wait for that setup to trigger, and that would obviously be a form of patience. But the hard part afterwards is to let things unfold. Steve Edmondson once said, I spend a lot of time researching things we don't, we ultimately don't do. And boy, this has really hit home lately. I have been spending hours and hours and hours looking at thousands of charts, and I haven't really found a whole lot that is worth doing. And I'll show you one reason why really soon. But you just have to keep chipping away at it. I remember I did a column a while back where somebody quit the trading service because they didn't see in the foreseeable future where we would have any setups. And I agreed. In the foreseeable future, I couldn't see where we'd find any setups. But later that day when I did my analysis, I found two commodity-related stocks that turned into two of the big winners, if not the biggest winners, for the year. And it's hard to keep chipping away at it. It's hard to continue to do that research when you're not producing anything. Ken Lambert once said, doing nothing is harder than it looks. And of course, Charlie Munger, it takes character to sit there with all that cash and do nothing. I didn't get where I am by going after mediocre opportunities. And of course, Tom Petty, the late, great Tom Petty said it the best. The waiting is the hardest part. Now, I've said this ad nauseum, so I don't want to spend too much time working on this or, or discussing this. But I do think it's interesting that she mentions the fat pitch. And this was based, this was the answer I got from a psychiatrist because I used to come in week in and week out and say, why is it that these successful doctors and lawyers and automatic transmission mechanics look for perfection in life, but they seem to settle for mediocrity in the markets? Well, the reason is, in their professions, they have to take whatever train wreck comes along, and they can't wait for the so-called fat pitch or perfect pitch. And the bottom line is we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of our mindset. If you waited for the perfect patient, you would you, you'd starve to death as a doctor because that patient wouldn't come along or be very few and far between. Now, this is the decision tree that I think is really important to help you develop patience and waiting for setups. The first thing, I often say the can't stand it test, okay? If you just can't stand it, then you absolutely take the trade. But can you walk away and be okay? It's the first question you need to ask when you see a trade. Now, the next question you need to ask is, are conditions generally conducive? So for a trend following methodology, that means that the market is trending, and ideally the sector is trending, and then obviously the stock that you're trading is trending. Okay. Now in some cases it might be a trend transition, but at least the shorter term trend appears to have turned and possibly the longer term trend has turned too. And the reason I did three arrows here is one for the market, one for the sector, and one for the stock. So if everything's trending and you think you've got a pretty good setup, then by all means, take the trade. Now, let's say conditions aren't generally conducive, e.g. now, okay, which I'll flesh out in a few minutes, then you need to ask yourself, well, do I have the mother of all setups? If the sector's chopping around, looks like electrocardiogram. If the indices are chopping around, looking like an electrocardiogram. Then if I think I have a fantastic setup, a standalone setup, one out of three, okay, one being the, being the stock, looks great, even though the sector's not so great and the market's not so great, then by all means, take the trade. 
Now, if the setup is anything less than stellar, then walk away. But here's a clincher. But be okay. And I've had a few stocks take off recently from the Landry list, but it doesn't bother me. It used to bother me. Landry list is a list of stocks that I publish every night in my trading service that are set up or very close to setting up or worth watching for setup soon. And sometimes it's hard watching some of them take off. And like my wife says, well, at least it's on your radar. Yeah, that's true. But you can't eat that, right? But in less than ideal conditions, some might take off without you, but you have to be willing to let them go. The problem with getting excited or getting frustrated, I should say, with a stock that takes off without you is that you risk the problem of selective perception. Now, in less than ideal conditions like right now, you'll notice that one that got away, but you won't pay attention to the 10 that if you would taken would have probably stopped you out at a loss. Now, one thing in developing patience, and this is the hard part, and I see this happen over and over, but the hard part is sticking to one methodology. And I've seen people do things like sell options or trade reversion to the mean and things like that in choppy markets, and they think they got it all figured out. And then the market begins to trend, and they give up all of those profits and then some, but then they say, you know what, I'm going to become a trend trader. And then that works for a little while maybe, but what happens is you eventually – end up perpetually out of phase. You can't be all things in all markets. I met a trader once and I thought it was a breakout trader, but the market broke out in reverse. And he's like, oh no, I'm, I've been playing those reversals. I'm like, okay. And then not long afterwards, the market broke out and then kept on breaking out. I'm like, hey, did you get cream trading those reversals? No, 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 I'm, I, I, I've been trading those breakouts. And whatever the market is doing, he always seemed to be in phase. Well, I call bullshit, okay? You can't always be in phase with the market. If you try to chase current conditions, more often than not, margin call, you're going to be perpetually out of phase. Dave, why don't you take your phone on the hook? Well, because I'll remember to put it on about two months from now. <laughs> so what I would encourage you to do is stick to one methodology. But then you need to really know where you are relative to that methodology. Now, the map isn't always clear because conditions are constantly changing. But one thing that I was looking at a couple of days ago is if you look at the S&P 500, and we come back to that little net net thing that I talk about ad nauseum. I noticed that you can go all the way back to December, which is three months ago. And on a net net basis, the market hasn't gone anywhere. Now, I know it's had some zigs and zags in between. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But for purposes of net net, where was the market in December? 2700 where was the market that should be 22 i think or 21 where's the market on march 21st okay three months and change later well it's at 2700 round numbers so on a net net basis the market has gone sideways so it's not a market that's conducive to trend following at least at the moment and again, you can't decide, well, I'm going to switch over to another form of trading and try to get in sync with the market. Because as soon as you do, the market will start trending again. Now, one exercise that will help you with patience, especially once you're in the trade, is mind sculpting. The term mind sculpting comes from... Ian Robinson and his book is Mind Sculpture Unleashing Your Brain's Potential. My takeaway from that book is that your brain gets wired 
when you begin to mentally rehearse something. And this is something that's been proven very important in the athletic world. You ever notice, like in the Olympics, I always th find it fascinating to watch these guys before, guys and girls, before the ski runs, you can see their head bopping back and forth. And what they're doing is they're seeing that course in their mind. They're mentally rehearsing. So my takeaway from this book is that you actually make, it's almost a physical connection. I think it's the, it has something to do with the, the neurons and there's like a insulation. I think it's a myelinated sheath or something where the, the speed of the information travels 100 times faster once that connection is sort of hardwired, so to speak. So what I would encourage you do, to do is mind sculpt your trades. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Annie Duke in a minute and uh, her book, Thinking in Bets, which I'll give you a link to in one second. She talks a lot about alternate outcomes and preparing for those ultimate outcomes ahead of time. Well, it's the same. It's kind of along the lines of mind sculpting. And the hard thing is separating luck from skill in a trade. But if you mentally rehearse these alternate outcomes, your life gets a lot bigger, a lot better. And hopefully your account gets a lot bigger. So let's say you've got something like a trend knockout, nice trending market accelerating higher, a big knockout bar like this. Then see yourself actually taking the trade when it triggers. And suppose that it doesn't trigger, just let it go, okay? You'd be shocked at the amount of people and I feel like I'm beating a dead horse on this, but you'd be shocked at the amount of people that email me months and months and months from now to tell me about a stock I recommended today that never triggered, and they're down 50%. Well, the trade should have been avoided in the first place. Now, I'm a little hesitant to say this, but unless you're in a rip-roaring bull market like 1999, then don't front-run trades, okay? There are... Very, very selected times where you could actually front run a trade, meaning get in a little earlier. But now is not one of them. And even in, even if that's the case, where you are front running and conditions are fantastic, you still want to be buying on strength for our longs. So this market would have to be rallying close to that entry at least. And you might get in a little bit early by front running the setup. But 99.99% .99 of the time, you want to wait for an entry. And it's amazing to me how many bad trades you could avoid by doing this. Now, let's say the stock does trigger your entry, you took your entry, you need to see yourself actually placing a stop. As I often say, people don't plan their trades ahead of time because as soon as you plan the trade, one of the alternate futures is that you're going to lose in the trade. You have to admit going in that you could be wrong and you could lose on the trade. But if you mind sculpt this, if you see it in your mind's eye that you're going to place that stop and let the chips fall where they may, then your life gets a lot easier. Now, this is negative, but you have to actually be willing to see yourself allowing to be stopped out. The great thing is, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. It's an old hedge fund adage. So, be willing to get stopped out on the trade. Doesn't mean, as we'll see in one second, that you, you made a bad decision by taking that trade. It's just it didn't work out. It's one of the alternate futures that happened, unfortunately, and trust me, it happens. Now, as I preach, garbage in, garbage out, so make sure, going back to that decision tree, that you pick the best and you left the rest. I know it's cliche, but make sure going in, you pick the best stocks to begin with. Now, here's the hard part. You have to be willing to see the stock do absolutely nothing. I know I say this ad nauseum. The people who you regularly see are probably rolling your eyes. Your eyes are glazing over, right? 
But I've seen this happen time and time and time again. People say, Dave, the market went up big today. The stock just sat there. There's something wrong. Or on the short side, even, I can remember one particular case where the stock went up, even though the market was down fairly hard. And somebody emailed me and said, Dave, I'm out. Well, okay, you're not following the plan, but that's okay, whatever you think. And then the next day, the stock implodes, losing over half of its value. Now, if you think about it, doing nothing's pretty easy, right? Well, as uh, I think it was, who was it, Senator Ken Lambert earlier said, eh, it's a little harder than it looks. But it's the hardest, it's easiest, hardest thing you'll ever do. It's hard for people of action, doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics, engineers, people who do things, Okay, produce things, it's hard for them to do nothing. But a lot of times there's nothing to do. Now, one thing that Annie Duke talks a lot about in the book is coming to grips with a negative outcome. Coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance will feel better than refusing to acknowledge it. Facing it only after it happened. And there's a familiarity, and again, because our brains can get hardwired, if you actually can mentally rehearse the trade, good, bad, and indifferent, then once you're in the trade, your life becomes a lot easier. And I've said this before, and I used to be a little afraid to, to mention it, but now the more reading I do and the more research I do on trading psychology as I'm working on this master course here in trading psychology, the more I feel like it's perfectly normal to admit and talk about these things. But a lot of times when I make a trade, I have like an out-of-body experience. I find myself making the trade, and then I ask myself a few minutes later, what did I just do? Well, that's because I'm training myself. I use the word training because I still make mistakes and I'm not perfect. But I have trained myself over the years to say I like this setup and take this setup. I'm not going to second guess it. All of that work is done ahead of time. You do that planning when information is static and unchanging. And that's when stress is lower. And as Montier and some others have said, when information is uncertain or changing, then stress goes up. Well, guess what? As soon as that market opens the next day after you place that, after you plan that trade, everything begins to change. As soon as you place the trade, obviously everything begins to change. So coming to peace in advance is very important with a bad outcome. And if you want to link to this, go to uh, my website slash books dash to dash read. And I update that list fairly often. I have a lot of books that I need to put in it. So check back often on that list. And feel free, a few of you have recommended some books that, that I either have here, have read. Uh, but keep keep recommending them to me so I can make sure I get them all and I'll, I'll, we'll read them all eventually and get them updated to that list. She also went on to say, when we think in advance about the chances of an alternate outcomes of alternate outcomes and make a decision based on those chances, it doesn't automatically make a wrong, make us wrong. I think that's what it should say. I'll, I'll probably use dragon <laughs> for that. Uh, wrong when things don't work out. It just means that one event in a set of possible futures occurred. OK, so either the trade is going to trigger or it's not. If it does trigger, it's going to be either a mediocre winner and stop you out or it's going to flat out stop you out and be a loser or it'll turn into the mother of all trends. And then in the end, of course, you'll lose a little bit of that. So once you're actually in the trade. Assuming that you did your homework the day before, and that patience is being able to walk away and be okay. So I did all my homework last night, and one stock that we've been looking at for a few days is the only thing that I could find that I thought was worth taking today. So that's it. Nothing else. So you have to wait for an entry. Don't get excited again and front run the setup. Once you triggers, you place a stop. You take the partial profits when offered. And then you trail a stop higher. So there's four things to do if you're following the methodology. 
okay? After you find a setup, and hopefully the sector's trending and the market's trending too, or making a transition and trend, as much confirmation as possible is what I'm trying to say there, then there's four things to do. And unless, those are, unless there's one of those four things to do, there is nothing to do but wait and be patient. So let's look at an actual trade. So you take the trade, you place the stop, and then look what happened. It went absolutely sideways for weeks. And then eventually you took partial profits. And then what happened? Well, you trailed your stop up to break even. And nothing happened for quite a while. And then you continue to trail a stop. And in between, there were a lot of areas where it just absolutely bored you to death. Usually, there's not a whole lot to do. And I didn't put the slides in this week because there's so many of them that I've talked about before. But most of the time, markets tend to go against you. And I think it was Robert Frey. Who's the uh, guitar player? I always get him confused with the guitar player. I think it's Robert Frey said that 75% of the time you spend yourself, you spend in a state of regret. You find yourself in a state of regret because the market is going against you. And I've done charts before where I showed the red meaning the trade's going against you and green means it's going for you. And there's very little green even on really, really, really good trades. So most of the time, especially if you if you have too many observations, you're going to be observing something negative, and you got to be careful because that could put you into a negative mindset. Now, as I said, in the end, even if you do capture that great trend, in the end, it's going in badly. You're going to give up quite a bit of that. What looks like a normal correction, at least starts off as a normal correction, turns into something much bigger. And you give up some open profits. Now, I've identified quite a few problems here. How do we make our trading trading lives easier? Well, during less than ideal conditions, and here's a really simple one. Just keep yourself extremely busy outside of the markets. I know people who, I, I remember when I first went full-time in my trading, I thought I'd do a heck of a lot better. Because I was doing pretty good as long as I had a job. Well, I couldn't wait to get rid of that pesky day job and focus 100% on my trading. Well, I was in for a rude awakening. Being too close to the market actually made my trading worse. When you're too busy to trade, you only take the best opportunities. And I've learned and relearned that lesson a few times. And I've seen a few of you guys and girls go through the same thing. The story I often tell was a doctor who had one of his doctors quit. That was covering the night shift at the hospital. So he started working days and nights. He had no time to trade unless, of course, he found the mother of all opportunities. My example here I often use is when I wrote my first book, I started trading myself into a hole. And then I realized that I was making a lot of mistakes that I preach against and said, well, you know what, let me just get this book out of the way. Let me back off of this trading thing. It's not working out so great right now. And then my big epiphany occurred once again, a secondary epiphany, I guess, kind of like when I first started trading full time. It's like, wait a minute. By making fewer observations and only trading when opportunities present themselves, and it's the mother of all opportunities, I did two things. One, I took the best setups. And more of those setups worked, so my percentage correct went up. And then the other thing was I held on to positions much longer and was able to follow my system more accurately by just letting things unfold. And I think that kind of helped me to, to make the transition. I've always been willing to hold positions as long as they move in my favor. But this exercise, going through this experience, I should say, allowed me to become confident in holding longer and longer and longer periods through that loosening of the stops. So keep yourself really busy. And like I said a second ago, just it's a can't stand it test. If you can't stand it, feeling like it's the mother of all setups, then by all means, take the setup. But make sure you ask yourself, 
Do you think you have the mother of all setups? Can you walk away and be okay? Jesse Livermore talks a lot about patience. If you had, well, I shouldn't even say it because I know you guys have probably already read it, but if you haven't read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator lately, read it again. I let the craving for excitement get the better of my judgment, desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions. Boy, is that where we are right now? Underlying conditions, okay? Is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. And that's the hard part, is being under that pressure to feel like you have to trade. He goes on to say, remember this, when you're doing nothing, no speculators should feel they must trade day in and day out or laying the foundation for your next venture. You will reap the benefits of their mistakes. Now, if you think about this from a technical analysis standpoint, let's say people are grinding it out and the markets are doing this. Well, that could end up making the mother of all bases and create a value zone. OK, and if the market breaks out from that, then this could become support. If the market breaks down from this, then that becomes resistant. So let's say you've got some sort of setup down here on a short side. Well, you know that if it gets back up here, you're likely will you will likely see some selling. So that can support your position. And the same thing happens on the upside. So those people who are continuing to trade during those crappy conditions could actually be setting the stage for your next venture. It's interesting you use the word foundation. Well, that's kind of like a base, just like I just talked about. That could be the foundation for the next big price move higher. Now, the way you follow a plan, or it's a lot easier to follow a plan, is you must reduce the number of observations. As I said a minute ago, be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. If you are swing to intermediate term trading, like we do, then 95 or 98 percent of the time there's really nothing to do, but you really don't have to watch a screen. But if you do watch a screen, you're going to get more negative observations than positives. That I can almost guarantee. And Mr. Frey has done a lot of research on that, so I'll, I'll take his word for it. But my empirical research on that appears to be true. I mean, think about it. As an example I gave in a column I wrote a while back, and I think I recently freshened it up, I was up like 20% one day in a stock, and then... I looked, I was all excited about that, and then later that day I looked and I was only up like 15%. Well, I felt like I was losing money. Well, I was. I was down that 5%. But had I just looked at it at the end of the day, I was like, oh, wow, it moved that 15%. It's like, oh, yeah, I saw it was a little higher based on where the bar is, but look at that. I'm happy with that. As opposed to making that observation, which should be a positive, and have it turn into a negative. So if you're staring at that screen watching every zig and zag, eventually each little zig and zag becomes much bigger than it really is. And you will begin to look, lose your focus on what you're trying to accomplish. Now, if you're increasing your observations, you're going to bring upon two forms of regret. And I was looking at the slide early today trying to remember my original thinking in it but my original but af after I looked at it a little bit I realized that the point I'm trying to make here is that if you are increasing your number of observations you're going to put yourself into a lose lose situation with two forms of regret the first form of regret is the regret of making an unnecessary decision in other words not following the plan so if you have a plan in place you have so many decisions to make based on that plan. But when you begin making a lot of observations, unnecessary observations, I should say, you then begin to introduce the possibility of more decisions. And with every decision comes what? Emotions and, of course, stress and a consequence. Now, if you 
don't make that decision you were thinking about. You have just set yourself up. Well, no, take that back. If you do make the decision, let's say to get out early, and then the next day the market tanks and you were long and the market tanks and you you dodged a bullet, even though your stop wasn't hit, you decided to just get out early. Well, you've just set yourself up for future failures by not following the plan. As I often preach, micromanagement will nearly always pay off shorter term, but longer term it will not because you're going to miss the occasional home run. Now, let's say you don't make the decision. You're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to get out because this stock's weak. The market's strong. Something's wrong. Well, if that stock tanks the next day, you're going to be stressed out. And I see this all the time. I have clients call me all the time. I knew I should have gotten out. No, you should have followed your plan. You have to be process oriented and follow your plan. You can't micromanage yourself out of every trade. And when you start watching the screen too much and regretting decisions you did make and possibly making unnecessary decisions, which you eventually will, you could easily end up in a negative feedback loop. Now, the easiest thing you could do is let the market make decisions for you. I have a hard stop in a position right now while I'm giving this webinar. At the end of the webinar, I'm going to check it. I'm either going to be stopped out or not. It's getting pretty close. Okay. So you could occasionally use hard stops. Now, one thing you could do is you could use a stop entry on setups that don't trigger right away. And I'll walk you through that in just one second. Now, I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but sometimes you could use them to take partial profits automatically. And we'll look at that in a second, too. And then once a stock opens, you could use hard stops to take you out. And if you're really struggling with discipline, you can put in a hard stop even before the market opens. I don't recommend doing that longer term. But while you're developing discipline, get the reps in. That's a secret to trading. Another one of those quote unquote secrets. In addition to there is no secret, right? But get the reps in. Get the reps of placing the necessary order in. Now, just to walk you through that real quick. Let's say you've got a pullback that's set up. And you could actually place a stop entry order here. Okay, let's say the stock opens down here somewhere and begins to sell off a little bit. Well, your entry was going to be right here. You could actually place a hard stop, a buy stop, okay? And go about your life. I've placed a lot of orders in my life that never filled. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I got filled. I, for I even forgot that I was that I place that order sometimes just because you will reach, not that I'm perfect, I'm far from perfect, I, I F up a lot, but you will reach a point where you become kind of automatic in following the process. I have friends who are a little bit more mechanical in their trading and they think I'm a lot more mechanical than I let on to be because I'm always preaching discretion, discretion, discretion. Well, I noticed that they seem to be a lot more discretionary then they let on to be. They're not quite as mechanical as they say, the more successful ones at least. But there is some autonomy to it. Like once you have the setup, you do place the order. And if that stock, again, doesn't trigger right on the open, there's some discretionary things you might have to do there, then put in a stop, entry order, and go about your life. Once it does trigger, then you could put in a hard stop, put in a day order, okay? So you can use discretion if you have to. But for the most part, you want to make sure you got a hard stop in place. Now, a second ago, I said limit orders. You could put a limit order to sell half at the initial profit target. I'm not a big fan of that, of limit orders, but occasionally I call it a pay me order. You can. I've used it before in the past, and you could use that and go about your life. And that way, if the market does spike up and hit that level and comes right back in, 
Sometimes you get paid. I call it a pay me order. Okay. And then, of course, in your trailing stop, you can use a hard stop. And then once the market gets really high up here, you might be able to leave a good till canceled, canceled trailing stop order in place, especially if something is just kind of chopping sideways like this. You just leave that trailing stop order in place. And then when it begins to move again, then, of course, you bump it higher. Now, one thing I often say is there's always a reason to exit a stock and rarely a reason to stay or any trade for that matter. And I'm pretty sure I said that long before I discovered the research of Robert Frey, which I think came from Dr. J, who I mentioned earlier, was kind enough to send that to me. And now I know why, because... 75% of the times your observations are going to be negative ones. So there's going to be some sort of reason to exit the trade. And there could also be a lot of extraneous reasons to exit the trade, like some pending news event, either in the overall market or in the stock itself. Now, if you're a short-term trader, I'm not saying you could completely ignore the news because it's going to be very hard for you not to get whacked occasionally by the news as a short-term trader and give up all your gains. What I'm talking about here is swing to intermediate-term trading where you hopefully occasionally catch, capture a nice longer-term trend so you can withstand a few news whacks here and there. But again, there's always going to be a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. Now, I got an email right before I went live, which sort of dovetails in with what we're talking about. So question for you. PAGS is on as an honorable mention. I have what I call the Landry list every day, which is a list of stocks that are set up or very close to setting up. And out of the Landry list, I pick my favorites, if they are any, that are worth trading. For instance, today we have one. And then sometimes I'll mention an honorable mention, something that I like, but not quite as much as the setup or setups that I chose. It jumps up, you say, taking it off based on the big jump today. Does that mean we should have bought it yesterday or you want a more pullback before you bought it? The answer, it should have bought it yesterday. Okay, when? Okay. Okay. So what he's saying is the stock triggered, which we'll look at in one second, and began to take off. Now, I didn't have it as official setup. I just said, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Once something obviously triggers on my watch list, it is no longer set up, so it comes off the list. As I've been preaching to everybody in the market in a minute and everybody on my service, is now is not the time to do very much. And as I just spent... 40 minutes talking about now's not the time to do a whole lot. But I lose clients when I preach patience, and but I'm going to keep preaching patience. So what I have to do is I have to at least show them what I think is the best I'm finding, regardless of the conditions, even if I don't think any official action should be taken. So he's talking about PAGs, and this was on my list coming into yesterday. Because it was in a pretty decent trend. It's an IPO, so IPOs are still pretty hot. And it made a nice little pullback and then began to take off today. So in this pullback, this would be an obvious trigger, even if you used a little bit of wiggle room, let's say 35 and a half or so and something like that, or even 36. Obviously, it would have triggered. So that's why it came off of the list. All right. Now, there's still a lot of fear mongering out there, and we've had some signs. I think it was last summer we had some signs that I think that's when I started the Winter is Coming series. And the question mark is, well, not just yet. And I put a question mark there because it seems like things are getting a little dicey once again. One thing that I find interesting is, you can't have a bear market without downside daylight. Now, if you go in over the last several weekend charts that I've done, you'll see I talked about daylight. And this is a weekly S&P 500. Upside daylight means the low of the bar is greater than the moving average. Downside daylight means the 
high of the bar is less than the moving average. And that's it. OK. And as you can see, just going through this briefly, you have bull markets with a lot of upside daylight and very little or no downside daylight. And this is a 50 day moving average. I'm sorry, 50 period moving average. So on this weekly chart, it'd be a 50 week moving average. And then notice again, pretty good bear market, bull market. I'm sorry, very little downside daylight. Go in and watch those other presentations where we spent the whole time talking about this. And very little downside. Again, this is a weekly chart. And as you know, we had a correction back in 2015, 2016. We did put on some shorts back then. And then the market took back off again. And now we have no downside daylight. Well, you can't have a bear market until you have downside daylight. That doesn't mean you want to sit around and wait until we have downside daylight. Okay. You want to honor your stops on any existing longs. And if you get stopped out, so be it. You want to be very selective going into new positions. And in some cases, like recently, you might want to consider a short or two. So if we back the chart out to the daily chart, as I said in several of those prior presentations, one thing I learned from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts is that sometimes, or in general, I should say, tops are more of a process than they are an event. Now, we all think of a top as a crash, but that's not always the case. A lot of times, yes, the market will crash, but it might form a big process top over a long, long, long time. And we could see that the market took off, it came in, it had a sharp retrace, sold off a little bit, came back up, and then now it's in sell-off mode once again. Now when we get to live charts, I want to walk you through that retrace rally. But one thing that's interesting about current conditions is we could be in the early phases of a big picture process type of top. So if this thing begins to sell off hard, People are going to say, well, it's crashing or it's crashed. It's like, well, okay, not maybe, but it's rolled over for a long, long time. And we got stopped out of nearly all of our longs. I think there's one more today might stop out here. So as I said recently, let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. This uh, is a little dated, but it's the same exact positions that are still on. And you can see we had that one long in there. And then we had two shorts okay and that's just what the database was producing okay a lot of slides come directly from today's slides come directly from trading full circle as you can see the little logo on them if you haven't already done so you can watch the first four videos and then there'll be a special offer on that but just go to two dash trade dash docs dash successfully if you can't remember all that, just go to my website and there, there's usually a pop-up in the post, which will give you the links to that. All right, let's hop out to the live charts unless anybody has any questions on anything. And yes, we stopped out on LX. There you go. Bam. Okay. Let's take a look at the P's first. As I just said, so far we have this retrace rally. You had a big spike down, and then you retrace back up. And then you also had a bow tie down at that juncture, too. Now, the bow tie really didn't trigger. It just kind of got messy in here. So that's when you need to maybe look at a two-day chart, a three-day chart, or even begin the backing chart further out to like a weekly, like we did just one minute ago. But the fact that we're stalling out in this retrace rally, that's a little ugly, and that's a little concerning. And then obviously, we're pretty close to taking out the March lows, which would not be a good thing for the market. So right now, it looks like a big picture top, so far at least, remains in place in the S&P 500. Now let's take a look at an updated weekly chart and you can see on a weekly chart, the bow ties have not crossed 
down. Let's check a daily real quick. Yeah, it looks like they're rolling back over in a daily chart. By the way, as I said before, when you have your first signal stays in place until and unless the top gets taken out. doesn't mean that it's a, it's a profitable trade because remember we had this first thrust formation here. And if you could stomach it when you do trade a transitional pattern like a first thrust or a bow tie, and you can get those on my website, you – you're not fully wrong until the, until it, the market goes on to make new highs if you're shorting or goes on to make new lows if you're going long. So that signal remains in place until and unless the top gets taken out. Now, your stop will probably take you out long before then. But that is one way to trade. Put a stop in like on an hourly chart, for instance, in Forex, I'll put a stop in above that old high if I'm shorting or above that old low. If I'm going long on the hourly, or on the daily, I should say, and if it goes on to make new lows, I know I'm wrong. So I'll give it a little rum on that. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, it's interesting that the NASDAQ never did officially bow tie down, and it went on to make new highs. But I would pay attention to these bow ties now. If we bow tie down, sometimes, as I say, the second mouse gets the cheese, even though this wasn't an official signal back here. But sometimes a market will bow tie, go up, make new highs, and then bow tie again. As I often preach with the double tops or any technical analysis type of pattern for that matter, they work, but they often shake out much differently than they do in the textbooks. Okay, so case in point, as I often say with the double top, sometimes market makes a top, comes back up. This would be a textbook one like that, okay? But a lot of times they'll overshoot that prior top and then come back in. This is the V-shaped recovery problem I often talk about. I'll show you an actual short chart. And then sometimes they'll stall well short of that prior high and then come back in. This is what's going on in the S&P 500 right now. This is, what's, this is what's going on in NASDAQ. And believe it or not, the Russell's actually more textbook. So right now in the three major indices, we've got three of the major patterns that are working. OK, so let's take a look at that Russell. As I just said, Russell stalling short of the prior high in here. S&P 500 kind of made that. So let's clean this chart up. Made that retrace rally we talk about. OK, installed short of its prior high in here. And then obviously the Nasdaq overshot it, came back in and Russell stalled right at it. I don't suggest you run out and trade off these big picture patterns, but be aware that they do exist and pay attention to them when they begin to occur. As you would expect, a lot of areas like drugs and a lot of these older brick and mortar type areas look a lot like the market itself. For instance, anything finance for the most part, is that finance? Yeah. Kind of looks like the S&P itself. This is a little bit extreme. You can see quite the retrace here, but a retrace nonetheless installing out. So that's the financials. Uh, manufacturing, another one of these examples, retrace rally stalling out. Drugs, I just think I mentioned. Health services, retrace rally stalling out. So the big, big cap areas that often represent the S&P 500 Look a lot like the S&P 500 itself. Retail, retrace rally, and then selling off, okay? Now, the technology areas look a lot like the NASDAQ, taking off and now pulling back into their prior breakout. Software, same sort of action as hardware, taking off, coming right back in their prior breakout. And this is that V-shaped problem I've been talking about ad nauseum lately. By the time the market gets all the way back to its prior highs, it's already overbought. It's hard to launch a new leg on top of an overbought leg. Semiconductors broke out a little bit, came right back in. Fairly ugly action today. Let's take a look at the SMH. The SMH looks a little bit better than the semiconductors from the Morningstar Industry Group. But you can see they're pulling back in after recently breaking out too. So now, obviously, is the time to be cautious. Let's take a look at bonds. 
Bonds are doing okay. So that's a good thing. So the baby's not getting thrown out with the bath water because bonds are bouncing. I would pay attention to these lows in here. If they get taken out, 2018 lows, 2017 lows, it would change the sentiment of the market quickly. Okay. We certainly put more pressure on bonds and stocks. And then you'd have both headed in the same direction. All right. Any questions on anything so far? Comments, amusing anecdotes, anecdotes. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stock questions. And again, just ask about one ticker at a time. Oh, okay, I like that one. Um, now, it's a fairly new issue, and you can see it's been a little wide and loose in here, but it's finally got its act together. And this is one that I had recently put on the Landry list. It was a TKO but it wasn't deep enough for my taste. So this one's on my watch list. I just like to see maybe a little bit deeper pullback in here on this one. But yeah, it definitely looks okay. There's not much out there that looks decent. Okay, James, you picked the setup for today. That's a that's a setup we're going after today. So we can't um, we can't talk about that one. But uh, good eye, James. Okay, keep them coming. Got a quiet bunch today. C S L D C L S D. That doesn't sound like a stock. C L S D. Oh, it is. Okay. The first thing that jumps out at me with this one is that it made like a hundred and something percent move. Over just a few days, it's uh, let's see, yeah, 100% in a couple days. And if you back the chart out a little bit, 121%. So once something jumps up 100%, it's hard for it to sustain that type of move. So I would pass. It's just too extreme of a move. I'd rather see it gradually increase in price and then accelerate higher than just have this one big one and done type of move. Now, I suppose this qualifies. I call them bottle rockets. If they jump up 100%, it's a pretty big move. But if they jump up like 200% or more, usually they come right back in. So in a case like this, it's close enough. It's up 100%. A lot of times, because that move is hard to sustain, they'll come right back in after such a big move higher. Even though, obviously, a positive move is a positive thing, you want to avoid the setup just because it more than likely it'll come right back in. And let's see what's going on longer term. Yeah, you got some wide and loose action longer term. You might have some bad memories back here. People looking to get off the hook. AMTD from Mr. Greg. Um, this is okay. As I begin to kind of pick it apart a little bit, you'll see that notice it really didn't clear this prior peak very much in here, and now it's already coming back in. Uh, one of the problems that I'm having, and we had a big brick and mortar type of stock on the list coming into today that I said, let's just pass on that one. And the reason is that these bigger, thicker stocks where you have actual earnings as opposed to pr the promise of earnings like a biotech, okay? But these bigger, thicker stocks like this, they're going to be priced for perfection. So when the overall market begins to tank as it is now, they too are going to be, begin to tank. And then again, you've pulled back to where you broke out from. So I would pass on that one for those reasons. All right, let's take a look at Keys, K-E-Y-S, K-E-Y-S, not familiar with this one. Yeah, okay, that looks pretty good. Um, it needs a little bit more pullback. The only thing that kind of jumps out at me, I like to see a little bit deeper pullback, maybe down here to 50, let's say 51 maybe or so. The only thing that jumps out at me is that it has done, it's been a little wide and loose, but it's gotten its act together recently. But it's had a pretty good run over the past several years. So as I said a minute ago, it might be priced for perfection. Go, Daddy. 
We'll let the dogs out. Well, that's another case where this one could be priced for perfection. Not that I'm against long, long-term uptrends, okay? You're certainly, you're certainly in the hunt by looking at these stocks that are trending. But the problem is, as I said, it might be priced for perfection. And also notice that you had this really nice breakout here, but then before it pulled back, it broke out a little bit before and then came right back in. So now it's relatively unchanged. It was just this one big breakout, and then that was pretty much it. And also on a net-net basis, you're actually slightly lower for a month. So I would leave that one alone, too. Loxo. Loxo looks pretty good. Again, you know, longer-term uptrend, you had this really big gap way back here, and then it actually followed through from that gap. Nice uptrend, pullback. It's a decent-looking setup. But given the nature of the overall market, this is actually on today's Landry list. But given the, day, the nature of the overall market, I don't think it's worth going after this stock at this juncture. But good eye on that one. I'll give you a high five since it was on my list, too. All right, any more? We had a quiet bunch today. LGND, that's going to be a pharmaceutical legend, right? Okay. Notice this prior peak in here. Looked a little bit better back here, right? And then it sold off fairly hard. It took out the prior peak, but then it came right back in. So if anything, it looks like it's in the early phases of failing. Let's put the bow ties in. And you can see that it looks like it could get a bow tie down here fairly soon. So I would pass on that one for that reason. All right, Greg wants to talk about TDOC four days ago. Well... It's a little bit of a choppy stock, as you can see. It did break out, but it wasn't the mother of all breakouts, okay? And again, you back the chart out a little bit. You can see it was pretty choppy back here. So I don't see anything that would have necessarily pulled me into this stock. Uh, maybe, no. I mean, it did break out and pull back, and I, I hear you. It's taken off again. But to me, I don't think it was enough of a breakout, an, an impressive enough breakout. Maybe if conditions in, in the overall market were doing fantastic, then something like this could work. But I would pass based on that. All right, any more? Quiet bunch. <laughs> All right, going once. Going twice? <clears throat> nope. You could, somebody keeps guessing the stock that we the stock of the day. No. <laughs> Good eye though. High five. All right. While we're in impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming again this week. As you can tell, I love doing these shows. I really enjoy doing them. Uh, so as long as you guys continue to show up, I'll continue to do them. Okay. One more. This one's on the Landry list. This is the actual one that I said. Let's pass on. Okay. And the reason I'm going to talk about it, even though it's on land your list, is it's a big, thick stock. Okay, look at this volume here. It's at zero, zero, like 5 million shares a day, plus you multiply that times its price. Just huge cap stock. Longer term uptrend, but kind of a not an easy trend to hold on to. Some pretty serious corrections along the way. Yes, decent looking setup, accelerating higher, persisting higher. All these things I preach about. Nice little pullback. But... A stock like this, high volume at high levels, longer term, given the nature of the overall market, is priced for perfection. So, yeah, good eye on that, Greg. Good, uh, You're doing a good job uncovering stocks that are on my land your, land your list for today. All right. Well, looks like that's it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Everybody, if we don't talk to you now and then, have a fantastic 
weekend. Anything unanswered, David, DaveLander.com. I don't know when the next show will be. It depends on my schedule, which is changing by the day. But hopefully I'll be here uh, next Thursday. If not, check my website for the latest. Any questions, again, David, DaveLander.com. Everybody have a great weekend. We don't talk from now and then. And hopefully I'll see everybody again next week. Thank you so much.